Welcome to Basketball Network. My name is Harry, and today we'll be talking to Brian Stith, University of Virginia all-time leading scorer, a member of the 1990 Team USA, retired NBA player, and assistant coach for Old Dominion University. Brian, welcome. Thank you for having me, Harry. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, Brian, you are Virginia's all-time leading scorer with 2,516 points. You led the team to three NCAA uh, appearances and an NIT championship in uh, 92. ACC Rookie of the Year, so many honors. Um, can, you, can you perhaps highlight your favorite moment uh, playing for Virginia? Wow, that's a tough question. I had so many great moments um, representing the Cavalier uh, program and rep representing the University of Virginia. But I, I definitely would say, you know, to me, the uh, the highlight of uh, my, my four years in Charlottesville would be my my first year when we were able to advance to the Sweet 16 and we were able to upset the number one seed, the Oklahoma Sooners, uh, with the right to go to uh, the Elite Eight. Um, you know, maybe as a, a, a young basketball player, I didn't know any better. I took it for granted. I thought it was always going to be that easy. Uh, and I learned to appreciate that you have to cherish those memories when you have it because there's no guarantee that you will ever reach that level of success again. So to me, that was my proudest moment as a Virginia Cavalier on the basketball court. You guys, you guys were very close to winning it all that year. You played against Michigan the next game. They were ranked third and uh, they ended up winning everything, but uh, you were really close to beating them too. Um, um, uh, I think the score was very close there. So great memories. Um, but the, the University of Michigan War, Wolverines led by Glenn Rice were loaded with talent and they had, you know, like six NBA players on that team. And, you know, they were just too talented. They were too good, you know, for, for us to be able to beat at that stage in our career. Um, you know, so we just had to uh, tip our hats to the better team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, when, when doing my research and check, checking out your college stats, I saw that you, you, only didn't, you didn't start only three games of your entire college career. Was that because of senior nights? No, that was because of little um, little injuries. Like, you know, one time I strained my groin. Another time, um, you know, I had torn a ligament in my thumb. You know, all of those were minor injuries. I had an ankle sprain uh, where I didn't practice all week. And, you know, they gave the nod to someone else. So, you know, that's just the, the grind of playing, you know, f you know, four years at the highest level of college basketball. Yeah, because when, when looking at the years, you know, freshman, uh, sophomore, junior, you missed one game each year. And I was just under the impression this was because of senior night or something like that. But <laughs> um, I was blessed, man. You know, even though I didn't start those games, I never missed a game due to injury. And that's mm -hmm. a blessing. Um, you know, so I, I was very fortunate in that regard. Who do, you, who do you think was the best player uh, you, you faced, you matched up against uh, during your college career? Wow. I mean, again, playing at the University of Virginia, playing in the ACC and playing on that platform, you faced great players every single night. They um, you know, yeah. I, I, you know, I had the privilege of competing against – a uh, Christian Leitner led Duke team, um, you know, for, for four years, uh, their success is unprecedented in, in, uh, NCAA history. Uh, so I would say my, my greatest competition would have been against Christian Leitner, uh, Grant Hill, Bobby Hurley, you know, mm -hmm. that, that team was Duke very team. formidable, mm -hmm. uh, personal matchups, you know, I went against so many great players. I went head to head uh, against uh, Dennis Scott, uh, Grant Hill, Walt Williams, Rodney Rogers, Chris King. I mean, the list goes on. I, I faced Glenn Rice when we played, you know, against the University of Michigan my first year. So, I mean, the, the 
number of great players that I played against is just too numerous to name. But that's what I signed up for because, you know, you want to measure yourself against the best competition in the country. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to attend the University of Virginia. That's such a great uh, group of players you mentioned. And you, you, you mentioned Christian Leitner's name a couple of times. He was your teammate uh, for Team USA. Uh, I believe it was your sophomore year, uh, 1990, FIBA World Championship in uh, Argentina. Uh, you guys won the bronze. You faced uh, Yugoslavia in the semis, lost to them, but then beat Puerto Rico for uh, the third place. What was that experience like for you? Uh, it was an awesome experience. I mean, I almost went to Duke. Uh, that's how much respect I had for Coach K and, and his program. It came down between – my decision came down between the University of Virginia and Duke. And, you know, um, so Coach K, you know, was always a presence in my life, and he was the head coach of that team. And what that team did, it gave me an opportunity to play against other players – um, of my statue, you know, in the game of college basketball. And I got a chance to, to, to practice against those guys every day or, you know, over the course of the summer. I got a chance to observe their work habits and, you know, what drove them. I got a great coaching, you know, from uh, Coach K, Coach Beheim, Coach Calissimo. I mean, that was just a tremendous experience. And what what that experience gave me, it streamlined my focus when I went back to school uh, my third year, and it just took my game to another level. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I felt that um, I was able to sustain that level of success that I enjoyed early in my, my college career. I was able to extend that because of my experience with USA Basketball. Mm -hmm. And, and those were one of the last uh, tournaments, I think, if not the last tournament when the, co when the college team was sent uh, to this type of championship. Just, just a different time, uh, you know, college versus the dream team. What was the expectation uh, coming into the tournament uh, for you guys? And uh, did you perhaps receive a lot of backlash from the media when you came home with the bronze? No, absolutely. Um, absolutely not. But mm -hmm. what what uh <laughs> what we encountered and what we found out was that the world was catching up um to united states in, in basketball uh, we played against a yugoslavia team that was that had five pros and who were legitimate global all-stars um we played against drajan petrovic and Vladi Divac and Tony Kukoc and Dino Rajda, all of these guys played in the NBA. They were seasoned. They had played together. And, you know, for college guys, for amateurs to be thrown together, you know, just over the course of six to eight weeks and think that we were going to go and beat seasoned uh, European all-stars, you know, that day had come to an end. And sadly to say, that we were the last college team to represent the United States before we had to bring in the Cavalry, the dream team, to uh, be able to reestablish our dominance over the world. Exactly. And, and, and like you said, you had a first glance at some of those uh, international stars like Oskar Schmidt and Drajan Petrovic. The league is really different today than it was back then. I think right now there's a quarter, one quarter of uh, players in the NBA are international. Did you ever think that was going to happen? Because it was really, really just a cup, you know, a few guys here and there uh, back in the 90s, uh, you know, that played in the, in the NBA but were from overseas. Did you ever see that trend of international players uh, coming in back then? No, oh, absolutely. Um, you know, even at that time, uh, they, they were starting to bring those players in, uh, although they weren't the um, – established stars that they are in today's NBA player, but the influence you definitely could see um, the, the footprint being laid for those players to be able to have a huge impact later on um, in the NBA. And it's just, it's just done, um, you know, tremendous uh, things for the NBA as far as engaging the world community to be able to watch our sport. And, um, you know, when you look at, the NBA today, 
um, you know, I would say that uh, our, you know, our game of basketball are in great hands by our uh, American basketball homebred talent, but also uh, the other talents from around the world, such as Lucas, Luka Doncic and, and the Greek freak and, you know, other great players, international players who are now calling NBA their home. Mm -hmm. After a remarkable collegiate career, uh, you went on to the NBA. You were drafted 13 overall by the Nuggets in the 1992 uh, NBA draft. What was, for you, the biggest adjustment you had to make uh, when coming into the league, to your game? Well, the biggest adjustment that I had to make was, uh, you know, how, how big and how athletic, um, you know, everybody was at this level. Um, it's definitely true uh, you, you, when you say that the college game is played at, at the rim, but the NBA game is played above the rim. And one of the strengths of my game playing in college was uh, attacking the paint, being able to score around the basket, to uh, use my size and my strength against smaller guards. Well, coming to the NBA, um, the size and athleticism forced me to expand my game, you know, out to beyond the three-point line. And that's what I had to do my first three years in the league in order to be able to find my niche um, at the NBA level. Mm -hmm. And when remembering that uh, Nuggets team, um, one moment definitely stands out, and it's, uh, you know, beating the number one uh, seed Seattle Supersonics in the 1994 Western Conference uh, uh, first round. Was that your favorite moment with the Nuggets or could you highlight something else? Because that was unbelievable. Just the first seed, you know, beating the, the, the eighth seed. What was the feeling like? No, nothing else can compare to that moment. I mean, uh, we were a young team who were hungry. We, we had a bunch of young, um, you know, s stars who were looking to make, you know, their impact on the league and make a name for themselves. And, you know, we had been playing – you know, up and down basketball the entire season. But, you know, when we got into the postseason, it just seemed to all come together for us and our confidence grew. So, you know, you know, watching uh, is ironic because watching this year Nuggets team, it, it reminded me so much of, of our team back in, uh, in 94. You know, the similarities were, you know, just, you know, you know, you know, so similar, you know, Denver had both teams had dynamic, prolific scoring port guards and Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf and, and Jamal Murray. Both teams had, you know, a, a, a great and dominant center and Dikembe Mutombo and, and Jokic. And then you had a host of other players who just contributed at different points in time. So watching this year Nugget team just allowed me to, you know, travel back down memory lane when we played and upset Seattle, um, you know, in, in that series in 94. And like you said, you know, great all-around all team uh, for the first few seasons. Mahmoud Abul-Raouf, uh, Dikembe Mutombo, Dale Ellis, uh, Reggie Williams, uh, Alfonso Ellis, yourself. Um, but do you think you guys were perhaps missing a piece when it comes to the postseason and when it comes to making that jump to, you know, playing the, uh, the finals, I guess, and, and, and just that one more step, making that one more step? I just don't – I just – I think that that team uh, wasn't given enough time to grow. Uh, I think that we had all of the pieces. Um, sure, you can add, you know, another two pieces, you know, to a team to, to bolster your chances. But, you know, I think that team just needed experience. Um, you know, and, and one of the tragedies that would be to this year Nuggets team if you don't give this team a chance to grow together and, and, and get a chance to continue to improve so that it can be a seasoned team. Um, but the one huge difference between uh, the the nineteen the twenty nineteen uh, twenty twenty Nuggets and in ninety four Nuggets would be free agency. Um, that that's the elephant in the room. You know, you would hate to see you know a big market team come in and steal a Jamal Mary or be able to steal you know uh, you know the Joker Kish, yeah. because 
you know, these teams are hungry for championships. You, you, you look at the Miami Heat now, they, they are just overmatched with the talents by the Lakers. So they're going to make a, a, a push for a player like Giannis. <laughs> and, I mean, that's just the, the way of the world. So is there going to be a commitment from the, uh, the ownership of the Nuggets to keep that young nucleus intact? You know, that's what we all have to see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you served as the Nuggets captain from 94 to 2000. What were uh, something that your coaches appreciated and recognized most um, regarding your leadership abilities? Well, you know, obviously I wasn't the best player on the team, but what they did appreciate was the fact that I brought my hard hat to work every single day, whether it was practice, whether it was game. And I led by example. Um, the older I got, the more comfortable, um, you know, I became and I found my voice and I was, be, I was able to not only lead um, by example, I was also able to give, you know, sound advice, you know, to the players in that locker room. So, you know, um, I think the, the, the coaches just recognized a quality, you know, that, that I possessed and, you know, they, they gave me a platform to be able to, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, spread those values to the rest of the locker room. And um, something that happened during uh, your years um, in, in Denver is kind of happen, happening right now, but on a bigger stage. So the NBA community today is all for fighting social issues. There was a lot of controversy surrounding Mahmoud Abul Rauf when he protested uh, during the national anthem. How did you and your teammates uh, react to this? And what were the conversations in the locker room like? Uh, I guess, why wasn't there an uprising like there is one, like, we, like the one we see today? Well, well, first of all, I mean, you know, it, it was so novel, you know, of, 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 an, uh, of an idea that somebody would stand up against uh, the, the American flag. Uh, I think it forced people to take a stand, and, and a lot of people were very uncomfortable, um, you know, supporting Mark Mood at that time. That, that went for players, that went for management, that went for ownership, and that went for the NBA. Times have really changed because you see the NBA standing behind the players when they make a stand, stance uh, against social issues. And it, it just allows the players to be able to express themselves more freely. Uh, Mark Mood uh, was a, a devout, um, you know, Muslim. Uh, he, he, he walked it, he lived it, he spoke it. So we were very comfortable with his perspective um, and, and his ideas, because we talked about it often. Um, I think that people don't realize that Mark Mu hadn't been standing all season long for the National Anthem, but it only took one person to recognize that, call into a radio station, and it became a national issue. And I think at that moment in time, people were afraid to listen and hear what Mahmoud was really trying to say. And it just put people in a very difficult position and it just basically forced him out of the NBA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you said, it's a player's league today and uh, you know, players are getting all the support and not getting fined for their uh, stances on, 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 on social issues. Like Mahmoud got fined, I believe it was from the NBA and perhaps uh, might have even got fined from the, from the team. But um, different times. Um, Absolutely, definitely different times. And, and, and it just didn't happen overnight. I mean, as recently as Colin Kaepernick, you know, the country wasn't ready to embrace that conversation. And, you know, only through, um, you know, the, the social injustices that we've seen recently where it just was, uh, you know, uh, uh, it just ripped off the scab off of so many people's wounds that it became, again, a, a national conversation. And people finally, you know, had the courage to, to speak up and be able to uh, give a, a voice to the voiceless. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, on to your, uh, on to basketball, I guess. Um, you scored a career high of 
eight three-pointers versus the Phoenix Suns in 1996. And this was back when the NBA league wasn't a three-point oriented league. And uh, I guess not so many three-point attempts were, were made. Um, what do you think your game would look like if you played in the, in the league today, I guess? And uh, just, just what do you think about the game and how it, how it has changed uh, from, from back then to now where, where players pull up three-pointers everywhere from the court? Oh, man. I, I mean, the, the game today is so different than when I played. Uh, I played in the era where it was so physical. Um, strength was was of, of of an essence. You know, you had to be big and strong to be able to play against the physicality of, of a player in my position like Michael Jordan. Um, you know, the New York Knicks were physical. The Indiana Pacers with the, the Davis brothers were so big and so strong. That was that was the identity of our league. And gradually over the years, it became more of a European play a style game where it was more free motion. Uh, it was more three pointers um, taken and the advantage was given to the offensive player rather than the defensive player. Uh, that's the reason why if a guy like Mahmoud Abdul Raouf had played in today's game, um, I really believe that we would have had a carbon copy of a player like Steph Curry and Mahmoud Abdul Raouf. Um, he was just before his time, and the game just wasn't ready for a player to do those type of things as he was doing back then. Uh, but the game um, has become uh, more appealing to the fans. The scoring is up. It's more exciting. Players are so much more athletic today than, you know, it was back when I played. Um, you know, every team has a Michael Jordan, it seems like. A guy that's high flying, playing above the rim, uh, where when we played, that was a rarity. So um, I, I'm, I'm glad to see the state of where the NBA is today. I'm a huge fan. Um, I watch the NBA all the time. And uh, I'm a proud to be a part of that fraternity. And you talked about the physicality during your time. Uh, what was who was the most what was the most physical team, or perhaps who was the most physical player? Was it the Pistons or the Knicks? Uh, the player, a, a team that you faced, or a player you played against during those times? I mean, everybody was physical. I mean, that just everybody had two enforcers. Um, our biggest rivalry probably was was uh, the Utah Jazz. Mm -hmm. uh, when we upset the, um, the Seattle Supersonics in the 94 playoffs, that's who we faced in the second round. They had Carl Malone and Eden, or Carl Malone and Ostertag, and Carl Malone and the Big Dog. Houston had Elijah Wan and Otis, Otis Thorpe. Um, you know, every team had two big physical presence that when you walk through – and when you ran through the lane, dudes put you on your backside. And I mean, Sean they Kemp you with elbow. <laughs> yeah, I mean Sean Kemp and Michael Cage, uh, Duckworth and 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 uh, and and uh, I mean they, they. I mean every team was just so big and physical. So um, I, I can't say that one team was more physically imposing than the other because that was just the way teams were built back then. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, you scored your career high against the Portland Trailblazers in 96, 37 points. You, you just exploded. Can you talk about that game? And uh, what was this? Was that just one of those games when, when everything is going in? Well, again, you know, I talk about, you know, the growth of a player. You know, when I first came into the, to the NBA, I was more comfortable playing in the mid-range area, and I was a very good post-up player and I was able to take advantage of mismatches. As my game evolved, I became more comfortable playing behind the three-point line. And, you know, that's just as simply of just putting in the work. So that season, I just remember that was my focus in the offseason, becoming a high-percentage three-point shooter. And, you know, that year, I was able to have games where I made, you know, eight, seven, six, five, 
three pointers in a game repeatedly. And, you know, that was just the evolution, you know, of me as a basketball player. And the league, I guess, was slowly going into that direction, but not really ready for what was going to happen in about 2015 with, <laughs> with the Golden State Warriors and the Houston Rockets and everything. <laughs> You know, back in when I played, when you saw a guy like Dennis Scott and Reggie Miller, you know, when those guys took 10 three-pointers in the game, we, we thought that was radical. Now, you know, you have players taking 10 three-point shots in the first half. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the game is just so different. But, again, it's exciting. It's fun for the fans. Uh, but if you are a purist of the game, you know, sometimes it can be uh, a little bit overboard. I don't like seeing seven footers shoot three pointers. I mean, that's just it's, the era that I came from. It, it shouldn't be a part of the, their game, but it is now. Everybody is <laughs> trying to be a complete basketball player. Yeah. Um, you talked about uh, your teammate, uh, Dikembe Mutombo. He, I, I think he's just such a likable uh, personality from his voice <laughs> to his uh, finger, finger wag, signature finger wag. Can you perhaps share an anecdote about him during those years you guys shared a locker room together? Well, look, Dikembe has one of the biggest hearts that I've ever been around. Uh, Dikembe and I were very good friends when you know we played with the Nuggets, and uh, by D Dikembe living in D.C. in the off season, and I'm from Virginia, um, we always used to drive from Denver. Um, back to the East Coast together. So we would coordinate, you know, what day we would leave. We would pack up our respective trucks and we would head across the plains together. Dikembe used to drive so fast. I mean, when we got out in Colorado, uh, you know, Eastern Colorado and Western Kansas, Dikembe was driving 90, 95 miles per hour. I was scared to death because I thought that if we had gotten caught, they were going to put us under the jail particularly me, because I wasn't Dikembe Mutombo. I remember trying to keep up with him, you know, on I-70 heading back east, and it was just virtually impossible. And he would always say, Steph, you need to keep up. Why are you driving so slow? As a big fella, the speed limit is 70 miles per hour, not 90. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, you know, those are just some of the, the, the great times that we had together. And, you know, those are, are memories that will last a lifetime. And, You know, we still keep in touch. And, you know, he's, he's truly a, a real and, and true friend of mine. Great, great, great story. Um, on to your coaching career. Uh, you're now the assistant coach at Old Dominion um, University. Who was your biggest influence as a coach or perhaps who got you into coaching? Well, my, my biggest influence definitely has been Jeff Jones. Um, you know, Coach Jones started recruiting me at the age of 13 um, when he was an assistant at the University of Virginia. Um, I signed with UVA, and after my second year, Terry Holland stepped down as the head coach, and Jeff Jones became the youngest head coach in ACC history at the age of 29. Um, so, so Coach Jones has been a part of my life for you know over 30 years and he's like a second father to me so when you know I've, I've always been a student of the game and i've been blessed to play for some of the best coaches some hall of fame coaches you know you're talking you know college coach k coach holland coach uh coach jones and pj calissimo behan and then in the nba i, I played for guys like bernie bickerstaff dan issel dick Ma. Otta, I mean, Rick Pitino, um, John Lucas, all of these guys had a direct influence on my style of coaching. And I was able to pull a little bit of something from each one of them to be able to have the makeup of uh, who I am today as a coach and how I try to impact these young men that uh, are in our program. So, um, Oppor uh, the opportunity to be here at Old Dominion would not be possible if it wasn't for Jeff Jones and the relationship that we've maintained over the years. So I'm so thankful for him and the opportunity that I have to learn the business of college basketball. Uh, for all those kids, uh, uh, young prospects out there, um, uh, when talking about recruiting, 
a player? What do you look for when, when you're recruiting a player? What are the top qualities you're looking for? And um, just what, what, what advice would you give to the young players out there? Well, what, when, I, when I'm looking at young players, you know, I'm looking for a player who played in my image um, because I know, I knew where I was at that stage in their career. And I've tried to make projections based on where I was when I was 15, where they were. And that helps me determine what level a kid should be able to go to. Um, and, and, but the one thing about, uh, you know, you know, going to the next level, all kids have an aspiration of playing in the NBA. And, you know, what you try to tell them is uh, enjoy every single moment because everybody is not going to have that opportunity to play at the highest level. I was very fortunate. I was part of that 1%. I lived my dream by having an outstanding college career at the University of Virginia in the ACC. I was drafted in the first round in the lottery. I had a 10 year career and I retired at the age of 32. What are you gonna do for the next 50 or 60 years of your life? So you better have something to be able to fall back on, something that you enjoy doing, going to work every single day where it's not so much feels like work, but it's something that you enjoy doing. And that's your true passion in life. So I try to impress upon them the big picture so they, be, they, they can be able to see and make decisions accordingly. Because, you know, what we have come to find, you know, going to college is not a four-year decision. It's a 40-year decision. So that's the message that I try to pass on to the prospects that I recruit today. Really, really good advice. And um, who would you say is the best player you ever coached and why? Oh, man. I, I've recruited some. I've, I've, play, I've coached some very, very good players, man. And, and they're still writing their stories. Um, you know, I coached Javante Green, um, my two sons, Brandon and BJ, at high school. Um, I've had the privilege of coaching Trey Freeman, Amari Caver, um, BJ and Brandon, you know, at the, co at, the, at the college level here at Old Dominion. So, I mean, everybody is unique and different in their own way. And, and everybody, you know, has, you know, what that special talent that they brought to the table. So it's been very, very fun being able to uh, make an impact on these young men's lives. Uh, coach, can I just ask you, there's a lot of reflection from the light coming into the camera. I can uh, barely see you. Any, any way you can... Uh, oh, that's much better. Much better. Much better. Yeah. Um, uh, what about Old, Old Dominion and um, goals for the team and the upcoming season and just the, ambition, the ambitions that you guys have? We're after winning Conference USA regular season title and, and tournament championship in 2019. We had ex high expectations going into the 2019-2020 um, uh, season. And uh, we battled adversity all year long. Injuries, uh, transfers. Uh, we lost uh, eight games by five points or less. So, you know, while we were disappointed in our season last year, we think that uh, we have a chance to be really, really good this year because we have everybody back with the exception of Aaron Carver, who uh, was a starter for us at the, uh, at the center position. So we think that if we can keep everybody healthy and if we can continue to grow and work hard, we have a chance to have a very positive season this year and bounce back from the 13 and 19 campaign that we had last year. And, and you talked about your two sons, uh, Brandon and BJ, uh, both of whom played at ODU. What was it like coaching them? And um, did you have a different relationship, like a father relationship and a coach relationship, or was it just a mix of both all the time? Well, I'll tell you, when I was in high school and I coached them, um, I got it so wrong. Um, I wouldn't say I got it wrong, but there, I made a lot of mistakes 
you know, I wanted them to be so good, so bad. Um, I pushed them hard. We talked about, you know, basketball, you know, 24 seven, um, you know, when we left practice, when we got home to the dinner table and what I noticed, um, you know, I was gradually pushing them away from me being a father and um, towards their junior and senior year, I had one of my old coaches come and talk to me and gave me some great advice. Coach Eddie Bland said, man, you shouldn't be so hard on your boys. They're doing everything they do to please you as a father, to please you as a coach. Cut them some slack. And I, man, I stepped back for a moment and thought about what he said. And that changed the dynamic of my relationship my last two years. Um, we all went our separate ways when we left Brunswick High School. Uh, Brandon went to East Carolina his first year. BJ went to the University of Virginia um, uh, when he left Brunswick. And I came to Old Dominion. And we all had good years um, at our respective um, you know, places. And, but when we all got back together in Old Dominion, when they tra when Brandon transferred from e East Carolina and BJ transferred from UVA, we had a different perspective. We cherished the moments because we realized that what we had at Brunswick was special. And when we went away, things were a little bit different. And when we came here, people just couldn't figure out our relationships. It was different. You know, you know, I would hug my sons after practice. They would come over every day and have dinner. Um, we didn't take those moments for granted because the time that we spent apart, we understood that uh, what we had was unique. Uh, that doesn't come along often and that we need to take advantage of the time that we have together. And our relationship here at Old Dominion only made our relationship stronger. It's really, really great advice for all those coaches, fathers out there. Um, what, I, what about your sons? I think BJ continued his, his career uh, overseas. He's playing in the Dutch league right yes, now. Yes, Brandon. Or Brandon. Yes, Brandon is playing. Uh -huh. Brandon is playing in Belgium, and BJ is playing in the Netherlands. So uh, they are about uh, two hours apart from each other, two-hour drive. So, and Brandon and BJ are very close. They're they are best friends. Um, last year, they had the opportunity to play on the same team in Belgium. Um, so, you know, their careers, you know, going well. They're having fun. They're having the chance to travel the world and, and, and see and experience different things. And, you know, that's what life is all about. And, you know, my, my only advice to them is to uh, take advantage of this time while they're young, save their money. And when they're professional basketball career is over, use those savings that they had to be able to uh, jumpstart the rest of their lives. So hopefully they will pay attention, you know, and, you know, and, uh, and be able to do that because, you know, they, they will have an opportunity to do something that a lot of people will only dream of. Great advice once again. Uh, all right, coach, we like to end every interview with a series of quick fire questions. So just really short questions and short answers here. Um, best teammate you ever played with? LaFosso Ellis, NBA, Anthony Oliver, UVA. Most underrated player in the league right now? LeBron James. Toughest matchup, your nemesis. Mitch Richmond. The GOAT. Michael Jordan. The best shooter ever. Steph Curry. All time starting five. At the NBA? Yes. Point guard, Magic Johnson. Two, Michael Jordan. Three, LeBron James. Four. Carl Malone, five. Will. Whoa, that's that's a strong team. Best international player of all time. Best shooter I've ever seen, Oscar Smith. 
best player. I think he's still writing his story, but I would have to say Luka Doncic. Uh, favorite NBA team growing up? Philadelphia 76ers led by Dr. J, Julius Irving. Would you rather win an Olympic gold or NBA ring? NBA ring. And uh, last but not least, the NBA Finals, Lakers versus Heat. Who's going to take it? After watching last night, the Lakers, sweet. Uh, makes sense. I'm too bad. <laughs> too bad. Everybody on the team got injured, but uh, I would have to agree. I would have to agree with you, uh, unless some something crazy happens and they just have a comeback. And uh, but yeah, that, that's a shame what happened yesterday with Bam and Dragic and Butler and. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's 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 almost like watching uh, when we watch the Cleveland Cavaliers play against the Golden State Warriors. I mean, you know, they were competitive, but you could see that they were overmatched. Uh, that's the reason why in the offseason, I think Pat Riley is going to do whatever it takes to see if he can get uh, Giannis, you know, to Miami to make them a formidable opponent once they get back to the NBA Finals because, you know, Pat Riley is going to do what's necessary to bring another championship back to South Beach. Exactly. He's one of the best. Yeah, both coach and uh, executives. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, Bryant. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. I wish you all the best uh, in the future in your coaching career with Old Dominion. And um, till next time. Thank you, Harry. I appreciate it. I really enjoyed this. You have a blessed day. And uh, I thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.